discussing faith over fear. Faith over fear. Isaiah chapter 43 in the first seven verses. But now saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not. For I have redeemed thee, I have called thee by thy name, thou art mine. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee, and through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. I gave Egypt for thy ransom, and Ethiopia and Sheba for thee. Since thou wast precious in my sight, thou hast been honorable, and I have loved thee, therefore will I give men for thee, and people for thy life. Fear not. For I am with thee, I will bring thy seed from the east and gather them from thee from the west. I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, keep not back. Bring thy sons from far and thy daughters from the ends of the earth. Even everyone that is called by my name, for I have created him in my, for my glory. I have formed him, yea, I have made him. Once again, Father, we stand in your presence and humbly ask that you will bless our services today, that you will uh, guide us in our Bible study, that you'll open our hearts, that you'll illuminate our minds, that you will, will help us to grasp from those things that are presented and place them in our hearts. And may all that we do here be glorifying to your dear Son. The prayer request, how we ask for the healing of the sick. The upcoming tests, Lord, we just ask for the guidance of the doctors as they work and the effectiveness of medicine. And we have so many that are sick and COVID and bugs about. We, Lord, we just ask your protection. And we ask for quick recoveries. Guide us now and forgive us. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's review a little bit. In verse 1 and verse 5, he said, Fear not. Fear not. Certainly we have a reason to fear not. Because of who our Redeemer is our protector, and the one who loves us. There's no reason to fear. But sometimes we are fearful. Okay? We are fearful. We are uncertain of our path. And we'll discuss that here in a little bit. But there are some symptoms to fear. There are some things about fear. Dear ones, Fear is a real thing. It can cause us to react for self-preservation, being afraid. I think it's a terrible, terrible day when elementary schools have to have a plan in case a shooter enters the building. That is a terrible day. And teaching the students what to do, where to hide. Teachers having to lock the doors, cover the window. But during those times, not only are the students fearful, but their parents are very fearful as well. But fear is a real thing. So what are some symptoms of fear? Well, first of all, I have doubt. Doubt. You ever doubted? You ever, uh, beloved, 
we open our Bibles, we read the words in here, and our first reaction is to say, I believe that. I believe every word, don't you? We believe it is the Word of God. But there are some times when we feel like that there are conditions to our belief. And we believe when things are going well. We believe when things are comfortable. But when things are difficult, okay, when things are difficult, the master of doubt in Matthew chapter 4 would tell Jesus, If thou be the Son of God, Command these stones to be made bread. He was trying to cast doubt. Now listen carefully. Jesus is the Son of the living God. He is God in flesh. And so the devil's poor attempt at getting him to doubt who he was <laughs> was a wasted exercise. Command these stones to be made bread. He could have done that. Okay? He could have done that. But he chose not to. And he simply chose to recite Scripture. And that is the best way to handle doubt, isn't it? Thus it is written, Thou shalt not, that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Have you had a time in your life when you wondered, could this actually be the will of God? It doesn't make sense. Lord, I know you know what you're doing, but I don't. <laughs> I don't see it. But God is always on the mark exactly where He is and what He's doing. And if our desire is to be pleasing to Him, then we will do our best to be where He wants us to be. Even in periods of doubt. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 14. And what a wonderful example. Matthew chapter 14. A wonderful example. Starting with verse number 22. And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to go into, get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitude away. And when he had sent the multitude away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, and the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit, and they cried for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. Amen? It's me. Notice. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, what's that? <laughs> if it be thou. There is the formula for failure before he got out of the boat. If it be thou. We must be very careful about saying things like, if it is the Lord's will. Because the Word of God plainly tells us what the will of God is. And we need to accept it, believe it. Peter said, if it be thou, I'll bid me to come unto thee on the water. And he said, come. 
He didn't say, come if you think you could make it. Come. And when Peter was gone, uh, come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And when he was come into the ship, the wind ceased. Then they came where in the ship uh, then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth, thou art the Son of God. Why were ye afraid? Why did you doubt? Well, could it be the storm? Okay. Could it be that he started looking around and seeing how bad the storm was? He was an experienced sailor. He knew, his, he, knew, he knew about storms and he'd been on the Sea of Galilee many times. He knew how quickly they can come up on the Sea of Galilee as it came over the hills, over the mountains. And yet... This particular occasion. Lord, if it be thou, let us be aware that in our prayer life, let's make sure that we're praying the will of God. It is true that in sickness and in certain situations, we're not real sure what the will of God is, to be quite honest. <clears throat> But we can pray, Lord, give me grace, give me your favor to accept what answer you give. Peter had, Peter, a Paul had a physical affliction, a thorn in the flesh, that he begged the Lord to take away from him. What was the Lord's answer? My grace is sufficient for thee. <laughs> That's not the answer he wanted. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. And Paul had to reach that point where he said, I will therefore glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Now to the natural thinking mind, we would say, I want my health. I want to feel good. I've heard people say, well, I'd like to feel like I did when I was 30. You couldn't handle that. If I had the energy of that little boy, you couldn't handle that either. Your wires would blow up. Okay? But you are exactly where the Lord wants you to be. So yes, we may not know, but His grace is always well available. Lord, help me by Your favor to accept Your will in this matter. Now this is going to sound terribly mean, but I say to you, and I say to these so-called faith healers, if that was really true, I would. why don't they go into the hospitals and empty them things out? Get rid of sickness altogether. I think I told you before, I had a church member, an elderly church member. Her daughter was involved in the, the no-cutting hair and plain dresses. And uh, she would come after church, she would come over to tell her mother all that God was doing and how many people were healed. And, and then her next verse, well, next thing was, I've got a doctor's appointment on Tuesday. 
got to see my optometrist because I got to get my glasses changed. She would start discussing her ailments. Now what happened? They said, well, they didn't have enough faith. Lazarus had all kinds of faith. Okay? There is an element of faith for the living. According to your faith, there is an element of faith for the living. But I think the Lord was well able to heal someone whether they believed or not. So, Peter set him up for failure by doubting if it was him. And in our lives, dear hearts, when we reach a point to where we begin to doubt the Lord knows what's going on and is in control, we find ourselves in serious, serious trouble. Be aware of this enemy doubt. You know, Peter became the rock, didn't he? But not here. <laughs> he became the rock, but not the night that he was going to be portrayed. Though the whole world deny you, I'll never deny you. Not then. It wasn't when he turned to the disciples and said, I go fishing. I'm going back to work. We had a great time the last three and a half years, but it's over. And I'm going back to work. He wasn't the rock then either. But he became the rock in so much that when they were going to crucify him, he asked to be crucified upside down. He became the rock. Sometimes the path, the path to being a rock in the Lord's service is a long, hard road. Be aware of doubt. Number two. <clears throat> Lies. You know the devil's a liar? Amen. Okay. Someone said, Pastor, are, there's no lies in the Bible, are there? I said, there most certainly are. What did the devil do in the garden? Did he not flat out lie to Eve about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Jesus was standing in front of the most religious people of the day and said, you're of your father the devil. The lust of your father you will do. He was a liar from the beginning and abode not in the truth. You know, a lot of times lies are like rat poison, as one preacher said. It's 98% cornmeal, 2% poison, but that 2% will kill you. At least that's what the rats say. Okay? And to accuse the Lord of lying... <laughs> As far as I'm concerned, it's a wasted exercise. Be aware of the fact that he sows enough truth and adds enough lie to make it sound good. But dear hearts, it's still a lie. Okay? Men will stand in pulpits this morning and they will preach lies. Things the Lord did not say. Nor did He teach. But lies in the Lord's work, lie, I shouldn't say Lord's work, excuse me. Lies in the religious community many times are based upon the addition of works. The addition of the flesh. Okay. Oh, sure. For grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It's all God that saves. However, there comes the addendums. However, if you don't live right, 
stay right and die right, you'll not go to heaven. What a, what, what a terrible place to live. Okay? So from now on, what we're going to do, we're going to put tape over our mouths and we're going to have our eyes glued into the Bible and do our best not to sin. Uh, you know there's always a way. You can put tape over my mouth, you can put a Bible in front of my eyes, but there's always a way to sin. We have our vase, don't we? We have our vase. Lies. First John chapter three. First John chapter number three. Down to verse number eight. Not only does this tell us where the lies come from, but who we are uh, mimicking or acting like. Notice, he that sinneth, excuse me, he that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy, destroy, amen, destroy the works of the devil. The Lord didn't just push him down, folks. He destroyed him. Okay? He didn't beat him halfway and let him loose. He destroyed him. Sin is of the devil. And when a person commits sin, they are mimicking or they are acting like the devil. That's hard stuff. Okay? There is no middle ground. There is no place called purgatory. There is no gray area in the Bible. It's either black or white. It's either God or it's the devil. One of the other. Okay? Next, I'd like you to notice the word deception. Isn't he good at deceiving people? Okay. I don't know what kind of fruit that was <laughs> that Eve took. But the devil made it to be something it wasn't. And it wasn't the fruit. It could have been anything. It was the command not to eat. Okay. Matthew chapter 13 Matthew chapter number 13, verse number 36. This is the parable of the tares. Wheat and tares look alike. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house. His disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man. Amen. The field is the world. The, seed, the good seed are the children of the kingdom. But the tares are the children of the wicked. It adds the wicked one. Okay. The enemy that soweth them is the devil. The harvest at the end of the world. And the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be at the end of the world. For the Son of Man shall send forth His angels, and they shall gather out of His kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be a wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father who hath an ear to hear, let him hear. You know, wheat and tares grow together. 
Now, my days on the farm, Dad would plant soybeans. And now, he did not use chemicals. Sometimes you see soybeans growing around here, and you see the, you see the weeds all withered and brown. That's because they have chemically put stuff on them. Okay. I'm just glad that those chemicals aren't harmful, aren't you? But they sow that stuff and those weeds. But sometimes dad, whenever he sowed wheat, there would be weeds that come up in the in with the wheat. And there was no way in the world you could go in there and pluck up those weeds besides the fact that they were too many. Sometimes he would leave portions of the field because there was too many weeds. And as many weeds as there were, that would cut down on the on his the value of the wheat when they would begin to measure. They would come out with a long stick. They would stick into the wheat on the truck and then they would pull out a sample and then they would look for weeds and then your the price of the of the wheat was based on how pure the wheat was. Okay? But those weeds, tares and wheat look a lot alike. Now it's not for me to judge whether a person is saved or not. That's not my department. That's above my pay grade. Okay? But I can say to you, if you have been born again, you know that you've been born again. But there are churches where there are tares among the wheat. What do he say? Leave them alone until the time of the reaping when the angels come and reap because they will separate the tares from the wheat. Now what's this about deception? They look alike. Okay? They look alike. In size and in action, a shepherd, they look alike. They're all carrying a shepherd's staff. They're all dressed a certain way. Sometimes they were good singers and musicians because that music would calm the sheep. Because the shepherd would have to stay with his sheep 24-7. Except when he got back home. So, they're, they're mixed together. But there will be a time when the angels come and they will separate the tares from the wheat. You know, it's easy, I shouldn't say it's easy, but there are people who thrive on trying to be the best Christian that they can be. Good Bible readers, good church attenders, maybe even teach Sunday school, maybe even be deacons or pastors. They thrive on these things, their own efforts, their own ability, their own understanding. They, they work at this and someone says, surely that man is or that person is a safe person. Not necessarily. One time as I was visiting in the hospital, visiting a pastor, and he said a pastor friend told him that they had four rededications that morning. I said, well, praise the Lord. He said, yeah, I hope they were all genuine. What do you think? <laughs> we don't know a person's heart. Thank goodness the Lord does. Now, the, I want to finish this by this point. As I said, if you have been born again, you know that you've been born again. You know that you're a child of God. Okay? But if there is doubt, if you are uncertain, then you talk to me, talk to one of our men, because you need to be sure that heaven will be your home. And you can be. I know, Paul said, that my Redeemer liveth. Oh, excuse me, that wasn't Paul, that was Job. And in the latter days I shall stand upon the earth, and though skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. Paul said, for I am persuaded. 
that neither death nor life nor angel nor principality nor powers and at the end of that long list shall be able to separate me from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now those three things can cause a lot of damage to a child of God. What is the thing that fights back? How does it fight back? Well, that we'll start discussing tonight. Okay? We're going to stop right there. Of course, I could go on for another 45 minutes if you'd like.